dynasties now that are connected with Mesopotamia, and this is called Old Babylon. And so this is where we want to focus our attention for a few minutes this morning. It was founded about 1894 by a group of people who were known as the Amorites. Amorites represented a tribal group. We hear of them in the Old Testament. You recognize their name because they pop up occasionally, usually as part of the Canaanite population, with a list of ites, you know, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Parasites, the Jebusites, the so on, and, and you know all of those that tend to be uh, delineated there. Well, one of the major groups that makes it to that list are the Amorites. The Amorites were far-flung, and we have quite a bit of information about them from sources outside the Bible. They're sometimes called the Amuru, or other names, but clearly it's referring to the same group. They were viewed from the point of view of people in Mesopotamia as rather rude and backwards. They were probably viewed about the way that ancient Romans tended to view the barbarians, threatening, violent, scary, but not very advanced. And that's kind of the way the civilized people of Mesopotamia tended to view these who were called the Amorites. But the Amorites did insinuate themselves into Mesopotamia and began during this intermediate period that we're describing, which there was no centralized authority. They tended to just sort of show up here and there, and many times they were willing to take the more lower class, if I can put it that way, type jobs, jobs that nobody else wanted, and they gradually began to become more and more of a prominent fixture in Mesopotamian life. There was always a sense of a difference between native Chaldeans, who had lived there, of course, for generations, and these relative newcomers who were finding their way in, who were known as the Amorites. But nevertheless, as they came, they began to move into certain villages, but they established a few communities of their own, and one of these was called Babylon. So Babylon is a city that was actually founded by the Amorites, and uh, it uh, is today not much to see, but uh, that's a photograph that was taken of the ruins of Babylon in uh, 1932. It looks like rubble. Those kind of wall structures you're seeing there are actually uh, pretty good sized. If there were a human being there, you'd see that they actually reach up quite a bit over a person's head. But it, was, it would be very clear from visiting that site that uh, it was once a great civilized area. It's been uh, rebuilt considerably so that today, in 2003, it would look something more like this. And you can tell that once again the refurbishing of it has been fairly significant. This is a shot, uh, these are U.S. Marines, of course, in the front there, and it was part of our occupation for a while of Iraq, and Babylon is located along the Euphrates there in central Iraq. It uh, kind of made press a few years ago because when Saddam Hussein was still with us, he was threatening to go down and rebuild Babylon. You may recall that. And he was actually going to style himself as the next great Nebuchadnezzar. Anybody remember that? And, and people who are interested in end of the world stuff were getting all juiced up about Saddam Hussein being the Antichrist and so on. I guess it didn't work out that way. But uh, nevertheless, Babylon is a known site and that's uh, what it looks like. The greatest ruler of this uh, region was known as Hammurabi. There were a series of minor rulers who more or less, these Amorite rulers uh, set up life in Babylon, but the first one who really comes along to make a name for himself in some way that reaches outside the bounds of that city-state was Hammurabi. He was There we are. I don't know if you can see that very well. He was, uh, I was about to say a good-looking guy, but you really can't tell much from that, can you? This is a sculpted head, uh, allegedly, of Hammurabi, at least that's probably our best guess. That's presently located at the Louvre in Paris, and there's been quite a few similar artifacts that have been uncovered along the way, and it seems that this is probably the character that we're dealing with here. Uh, Hammurabi began his raid in, in 1792, so it's about a hundred years after the uh, founding of this city that Hammurabi comes along. When he, when he 
comes to the rule in Babylon. He's just another of these kind of minor rulers. Babylon has been ruled by several along the way. About the time that he becomes the ruler, if we're trying to orient ourselves to what's going on in biblical history, this would be about the time of the birth of uh, Jacob and Esau. They were born in 1791, about the time that Hammurabi became king. Jacob and Esau, of course, you know, are the sons of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. And so we're right in the middle of what's called the patriarchal period. So the rule of Hammurabi is taking place in Mesopotamia about the time that we have the patriarchs on the scene in Canaan. Abraham may still be alive. The Bible says he lived to be 175 years old. If that's the case, then he would have still been alive at this time, but of course he was getting up there by this point as well. So uh, Jacob and Esau are born about this time. Initially, when Hammurabi takes control of Babylon as the next ruler in this line of rulers, he's a relatively minor king surrounded by much greater powers, and it wouldn't appear, you wouldn't think on the face of it, that there was any likelihood that he was going to become some kind of major character that we'd be talking about 3,000 years later. But nevertheless, he was a very bright guy, and he had designs that he seems to have been planning and implementing from a very early period in his career as a ruler. The first of which had to do with the publication of his rather famous code. And so if you've heard of Hammurabi at all, then what you've probably heard of is the code of Hammurabi. Hammurabi's code was published about five years into his reign. He seems to have been enlightened in this sense that he knew that the possibility of growth and stability and order in a community depended in some significant measure on a sense that people would have of a kind of predictability about the law. It was common at the time for the king to simply be the rule. Whatever the king said was the way it was, and that would always give rise to a certain degree of anxiety and instability and unpredictability depending on what mood the king happened to be in. Hammurabi had some idea that it's good for people to be able to rely on fixed principles. And we would say that's a fairly enlightened attitude. And he seems to have wanted to communicate that thought to his people early on. And so he publishes this code for which he's become famous. And we'll go back uh, in a few minutes and take a closer look at that. About 20 years into his reign, he begins with a rather surgical precision to expand. And so picking out the weakest of his neighboring uh, colleague rulers, he attacks and conquers. And he does it in a way that just gradually develops increasing power and expands until finally, by the time he is finished with this campaign of expansion, he has developed an empire which is pretty expansive in its size. So you can see, looking at this, if you can see it, uh, right in this, the darker colored area in the middle there is Babylon, its immediate regions, and then it extends all the way down to the Persian Gulf and up past Mari, all the way to, uh, or nearly to, Quran. And so Hammurabi really does, by the time he's finished, dominate all of Mesopotamia. The only ruler that had a larger empire than Hammurabi was Sargon, who we looked at back with the Akkadian dynasty. So he's quite uh, effective, not only in empire building, but also in his understanding of law and how it should work out in, in the life of his people. Hammurabi died in the year 1750. As is often the case, he didn't have a real great plan for succession. His sons were not nearly as competent as he was, and over the next several years, a hundred years or so, the empire survived, but it kept sort of shrinking based on forces nibbling away at the external borders of it until finally by the end of this imperial period, uh, Babylon had shrunk considerably. So he really is the guy that brings it to its highest and most impressive expanse. 
Uh, Babylon fell in a surprise attack by the Hittites in 1595. So that's the end of old Babylon. That's kind of the quick historical sketch. The Hittites were up in what's called Anatolia, otherwise known as Turkey. They came down in a very swift attack and just sacked Babylon, but they didn't care about staying around, so they just took some good stuff, went home, left a vacuum, and the group that came in in that vacuum were a group called the Kassites, and I'll save any comment about them for a little bit later. But that's, that's the basic sketch of old Babylon, so probably more than you wanted to know on the subject, but there we are. The um, code for which Hammurabi is famous was inscribed on a stone stele, as it's called. That thing is about eight feet tall. And again, if uh, anyone ever seen it, it's in the Louvre. Has anyone ever seen it up close and personal? I never have. But it's a pretty good size unit. And this thing was uh, uh, the, the, it was the discovery of this that gave rise to our understanding of what's called Hammurabi's Code. It was intended to be displayed publicly. So as I say, about five years into his reign, this big monument was placed out apparently right in the city square. Most of these Mesopotamian cities were organized around a center square, which usually had a religious character to it. If there was a ziggurat in the town, which there certainly was in Babylon, that's where you would find it. And it appears that this monument was right out in front. So interestingly, Hammurabi wants to tie this code that he's published now to his people in Babylon to some sort of divine source. And it has a kind of quasi-religious aspect to it, even though for the most part it represents rather practical law and practical principles by which people would uh, govern their lives. It was uh, the first really clear example in ancient you know, legislative history or jurisprudence of the development of what's called in, in civil theory uh, lex rex, the law is the king, or what we sometimes call the rule of law. It was not well known in the ancient world. This is why Hammurabi deserves some credit, you know. This was a rather surprising and enlightened development for him to come, across, come upon and begin to uh, uh, organize, make an organizational principle of his, his uh, rule. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it does seem to represent uh, something of a novelty in that sense. This uh, particular monument here, this stele, was uh, plundered by the Elamites. We hear of the Elamites in the Bible. They were to the east of Babylon. It's a region that eventually became known as Persia and today is called Iran. And these people came across at a certain point after the reign of Hammurabi, before the end of the Babylonian dynasty, and they plundered some of the goods from Babylon and they took this back home with them, threw it on the back of an ox cart, you know, and take it back to Elam, where it got lost, buried in the sands of time, as it were, until it was discovered in 1901 by some French archaeologists who immediately recognized its importance, and they grabbed it and took it to Paris, and it's been there since then. So it's uh, currently in France, and it was quite a sensation when it was discovered in 1901 because it was immediately recognized by those people who are familiar with these issues that, at least on the face of it, there seemed to be some correlation between Hammurabi's code on the one hand and the code that comes later through Moses on the other. And of course, critical scholars immediately jumped on that and said, oh, we knew it all along. Moses just borrowed from Hammurabi all of his stuff, and this is not divine revelation at all, you know, that kind of thing that sometimes people will uh, seize upon as a reason to doubt the trustworthiness of the scriptures. So anyway, that has made Hammurabi's code something of an interesting question for Old Testament scholars and ancient historians who are concerned about this. Well, the organization of Hammurabi's code is, is uh, it's basically 282 separate laws. They're written on 12 tablets, which are inscribed. This is a kind of a close-up of what they would look like, if anyone can make that out. That's uh, cuneiform once again. But it's uh, 282 separate laws written in Akkadian which was the language of the day. It was intended to be read. 
uh, it was uh, intended to sort of publish then the rules by which people could organize their lives and so on. The code tends to be, we'll see some examples of it in a minute, very specific. Each offense that is mentioned receives a particular punishment. Sometimes these punishments are quite severe by modern standards. There are many capital offenses, as we'll see in a minute. There are many offenses that would result in some kind of disfigurement. But one of the most dramatic aspects of the Code of Hammurabi was the use of what's called the lex talionis. The lex talionis literally means the law of the eye. It's also the root of our word retaliation, and the popular expression of it is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And so the first expression we ever have in history of that rule, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, of course, we find in Hammurabi's Code. That is probably the most dramatic correlation between Hammurabi on the one hand and Moses later, who of course uses the same formula. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, the lex talionis. I don't want to be overly subtle at this point, but I do think, in fairness, one could say that when you see the lex talionis in Hammurabi's usage of it, it tends to be conceived of as something that would be applied with a certain degree of vigorous literal force, an eye for an eye. <clears throat> Many Old Testament scholars have looked at the use of that term in Moses and said this is functioning a somewhat, has a somewhat different function <clears throat> in, uh, in Moses' use of it. That it's not expected so much to be implemented in a sort of literal way, it's actually a principle of restraint. As if in Moses it's saying you cannot punish a person for a crime to a degree that is disproportionately severe based on the crime that itself was, it's only an eye for an eye, in other words, not a life for an eye, that kind of thing. Whereas in Hammurabi's use of it, that sense of restraint is not quite so clear. Now again, that would be a debated point and I'm just suggesting a perspective on that, but it is at least on the face of it interesting that we have both of them using the same code, or this, this same rule. At the very top of the stele that uh, I was just pointing out, there is this carving, which you probably noticed, and if you can see that on the left of it there, that would be Hammurabi, and Hammurabi is in front of a seated character, and that seated character is Shamash who is the sun god of the Sumerians and was a god that was, of course, well known throughout Mesopotamian history. The concept is that, of course, Hammurabi is receiving this code from the sun god who was associated with law and is responsible, therefore, to carry it down and promulgate it among the people. And so that's the picture. Hammurabi gets it from God or from the gods and gives it to the people. That, again, has some similarity to the biblical understanding. Moses went up on the mountain. He received the law from God, the Ten Commandments, inscribed by God, as you know, and promulgates them to the people. That's not unique to those two. We find a similar idea in Solon of Athens, in Lycurgus of Sparta, in Numa of Rome, and others, where you have this notion of the law is actually given by the gods and is entrusted through one particular person to the people for their good. And so there's nothing unique about this, and we, I don't suppose, should be too surprised that we find the biblical narrative suggesting something like that. Those are points of similarity. I think there's some points of significant difference, but nevertheless, we should at least acknowledge that those are points where you can see something that appears to be a, a similar kind of uh, idea. The parallels have been noted, as I'm saying, but I think we also need, in fairness, to recognize that there have been considerable differences between the one rule and the other. For you briefly, a little bit of the preamble from Hammurabi's Code. This is a lengthy preamble, and this is only the first of about a half a dozen paragraphs, so it goes on at some length, but I just want you to think about what you hear here and compare it to what we just read in the preamble that came from the book of Exodus. So uh, my eyes aren't that good, so I'm going to try to see this from here. Uh, this is the preamble, quote, When Anu, the sublime, king of the Anunnaki, and Bel, the lord of heaven and earth, 
who decreed the fate of the land assigned to Marduk, the overruling son of Ea, God of righteousness, dominion over earthly man, and made him great among the Ajiji, they called Babylon by his illustrious name, made it great on earth, and founded an everlasting kingdom in it, whose foundations are laid so solidly as those of heaven and earth. Then Anu and Bel called by name me, Hammurabi, the exalted prince who feared God to bring about the rule of righteousness in the land, to destroy the wicked and the evildoers, so that the strong should not harm the weak, so that I should rule over the black-headed people like Shamash and enlighten the land to further the well-being of mankind. Now that's representative. It goes on, as I say, at some length. And what you notice in the flavor of this preamble is Hammurabi gets, keeps getting more and more attention, you know. He really is using this as a kind of PR piece to sell the Babylonian people not only on the dignity of the law that he is providing to them, but on the very special status that he himself enjoys, that he claims for himself a kind of unique status among the people, and in some ways the preamble is more about Hammurabi than anything else. And I just want you to compare that with the flavor of what we read in the book of Exodus, where you really don't find Moses peddling Moses. I mean, certainly Moses is prominent and gets you know, rightly so, a fair amount of attention, but the real focus there, of course, is on God himself, who comes down to the majestic power and holiness and glory that's associated with his presence. This is what terrifies the people. This is what gets their attention. This is what gives rise to the warnings that this God might break out against them. There's a very deep sense in which it's God's presence which alarms and fills with awe the people with respect to this law that they're receiving. Really nothing like that at all. That is unique, not only when compared with Hammurabi, but compared with any of the ancient Near Eastern civilizations. Something different is in the air when you begin to see the way in which God comes to his people and presents his, himself to them as the Holy One of Israel. And that theme, the holiness of God, as you're well aware, courses its way through the Old Testament documents and represents something that is just startlingly distinct with respect to the way that we see God presented in the Old Testament scriptures as opposed to what we find in other sources, whether it's Hammurabi or anyone else. Let me give you a couple of examples here of uh, individual laws that come from uh, Hammurabi. I want the lawyers in the room to think about due process here on this first one. Quote, if anyone bring an accusation against a man and the accused go to the river and leap into the river, if he sink in the river, his accuser shall take possession of his house. But if the river prove that the accused is not guilty, and he escape unhurt, then he who brought the accusation shall be put to death, while he who leaped into the river shall take possession of the house that had belonged to the accuser. Now, if that's the only thing we had from Hammurabi, I doubt that we'd be talking about him today, you know. But it is interesting that peppered through these 282 regulations, we do find this sort of trial by ordeal that pops up occasionally. And that in itself, I think, gives us pause. Now, some of Hammurabi's laws are quite enlightened, and I think we can be impressed with them, but this is number two on the list. Out of 282, this is number two, where the proof of innocence is based on how you survive jumping into a river. And as I say, due process usually would say there's probably some other things that should go into the test of guilt or innocence than whether you can swim. But uh, nevertheless, that's the second of them. The third is as follows, quote, if anyone bring an accusation of any crime before the elders and does not prove what he has charged, he shall, if it be a capital offense charged, be put to death. Now this is 
not dissimilar from something we find in Moses. Uh, Moses does have a rule that if somebody is trying to invoke the judicial process as a way of essentially committing murder, that is to say, I bring an accusation against somebody claiming that I saw them commit some horrible offense, something that would normally result in the death penalty, and then it comes to light that I myself did that with a kind of malicious intent, knowing better, knowing the person was innocent, but trying to use judicial process to, you know, get rid of that person, then I myself should be subjected to the same penalty that I was attempting to subject that person to. You understand how that works. Moses has a similar rule. Personally, I don't think it's such a bad rule, you know, if somebody knowingly uh, accuses someone knowing that they could, you know, result in, in that person's death and to have that come back upon them uh, may not be such a bad concept. So at this point, I'm willing to give Hammurabi credit. That was a pretty good rule, I think, and Moses does have something like that. Uh, his fifth rule, his fifth law, if a judge try a case, reach a decision, and present his judgment in writing, if later error shall appear in his decision, and it be through his own fault, then he shall pay twelve times the fine set by him in the case, <clears throat> and shall be publicly removed from the judge's bench, and never again shall he sit there to render judgment. This would be the classic bribery situation. Hammurabi does, to his credit, outlaw bribery of judge. He doesn't want judges who are on the take. He wants judges who are detached and disinterested and will render judgments which are uh, fair to the evidence that's provided. Moses has a similar rule, so we'll give Hammurabi credit for that one. Uh, this one is the eighth of them. If anyone steal cattle or sheep or an ass or a pig or a goat, if it belonged to a god or to the court, the thief shall pay thirtyfold therefore. If they belong to a freed man of the king, he shall pay tenfold. If the thief has nothing with which to pay, he shall be put to death. Notice a couple of things. First, the gradation of the society. The dignity of the person wronged to some degree determines the uh, severity of the punishment. Notice secondly, that if a person is unable to provide restitution, then they may lose their life in the process. Moses doesn't have anything like that. He does have a rule of restitution. You steal a guy's sheep, you're caught, you have to pay back fourfold. Moses doesn't have anything so severe as if you're so poor you can't pay it back, then you lose your life. Moses would simply have the person work and work off the debt in some kind of restitution uh, provision there. Uh, a couple of more just for fun. Uh, Hammurabi says, uh, if anyone break a hole into a house to steal, he shall be put to death before that hole and be buried. So you break into someone's house and for that crime of invading someone else's home, you are, you can be put to death. Moses has a rule like that, but it only applies at night. And in fact, we have a rule like that in American jurisprudence. If someone breaks into your house at night, you are not able to surmise their intent and you have reasonable you know, conviction that they may mean you harm, then you can use lethal force at that point. I think you're all aware of that. Uh, the rule doesn't apply in the daytime. If someone breaks in in broad daylight and, and there's no indication of their intent to you know, do you immediate grave bodily harm or death, and you are not justified in taking their life. Here in Hammurabi, the rule is somewhat more severe. Moses had a similar kind of distinction as well. Uh, if anyone is uh, committing a robbery and is caught, he shall be put to death. So you, there's a fair amount of severity in these rules. Generally, the laws of Hammurabi covered commercial transactions, slavery relationships, marriage relationships, and theft. That was the Broad, most of the rules covered those subject areas. All right, so there's Hammurabi's code. What I'd like to do is <clears throat> describe in the few minutes we have left, which is not too many, but I've got five, okay, uh, the most significant differences between the code of Hammurabi on the one hand and what we find in the Law of Moses on the other. The first of these, and one that I think is maybe uh, one of the most interesting, is that Hammurabi's code is in all cases 
casuistic, whereas Moses provides at the very beginning what's called apodictic law. Casuistic means case law. The formula expression is always if then, if this, then that. If a person does this crime, then this is the penalty that will follow. And we saw the examples of that, of course, and that's peppered throughout all of the code of Hammurabi. Hammurabi never gives us what's called apodictic law, pronouncement law, such as what we find in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. You see, you never see that. You never see a great kind of ethical maxim that is the guiding principle under which casuistic law must operate. Moses has casuistic law, Hammurabi does not have apodictic law. And that apodictic law does suggest a kind of divine origin. This is as if God is laying down a great rule by which we should conduct our lives. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not commit adultery, and so on. You see these great kind of powerful, solemn pronouncements. Then, casuistic law construes it. For the lawyers in the room, this is very similar, almost uh, identical, really, to our distinction between legislative law and case law. We have some law that comes from the legislature, some that com comes from the cases. And in a sense, in the Old Testament, you have that kind of distinction. Great pronouncements, as it were, God's legislation, followed by application in particular cases. So that's one difference that I think at least is, uh, is interesting and worth probably more attention than I've just given it. Moses emphasizes duties to God as the basis for duties to man. Hammurabi doesn't do this. This is important. It may be one of the weightiest differences. For Hammurabi, the reason you obey the law is for the good of the civilization, and the main incentive you have for obeying the law is fear of punishment. There is a kind of might makes right principle that's operating here. Do what you're required to do, or we're going to slap you. Maybe slap you pretty hard. Moses has certainly punishments built into his code, but you realize all along that the real basis for obeying the law is that I have this fundamental prior duty to God. And that's stated in the first four rules of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You know, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You shall not make graven images and so on. All of that is to root a person's understanding of obedience in their duties to God, their obligations to honor him and so on. And then out of that flows responsibilities to my neighbor. And that's supposed to be what drives my allegiance to the law and my appreciation of uh, my neighbor's status as one made in the image of God. Moses has no trial by ordeal. You find it peppered through Hammurabi. Some of Hammurabi's rules are pretty good in a due process sense. Some are pretty strange. He has one rule that a thief would have his tongue singed by a red-hot iron. And then the priest examines the blisters on the tongue to determine guilt or innocence. Moses doesn't have that. He doesn't have anything like a trial by ordeal. The closest he comes is a rather strange law that says if a wife is accused of unfaithfulness, she should be brought to the temple or to the tabernacle and made to drink a potion. Well, the potion, if you look at the ingredients, is harmless. It's not a poison or anything like that. And then, if the woman is actually guilty, some negative consequences will take place physiologically, and if not, she'll be fine. Personally, I think there's kind of a psychological element behind the whole thing. I don't have time to develop that, but it's certainly not trial by ordeal like jumping into a river or having your tongue singed. I mean, this is really absent from Moses, though it was fairly common in other cultures of the ancient world. Uh, the punishments in Hammurabi are generally quite a bit more severe. We usually view Moses as pretty severe. He has, he has 32 separate capital offenses. That's Moses, you know. Uh, but Hammurabi is even more severe. So in some ways you'd say vis-a-vis -vis Hammurabi, Moses is a model of liberal leniency in the ancient world. <laughs>
uh, not so much in the modern world. Uh, class distinctions are greatly diminished in Moses. There is a kind of uniformity of application of the law, what we would call equal protection under the law. Even the king is bound by the law under Moses. I heard one commentator say once, the king was the least free person in all of ancient Israel because he was not only obligated to keep the law everyone else was obligated to keep, he also had a special law called the king's law, added rules that bound the king. In Hammurabi, no such thing. There's class distinctions, there's varying degrees of guilt or innocence and severity of punishments based on where you are in the social order. That sort of thing is not so present in Moses. Moses recognizes in a way that Hammurabi really doesn't the intrinsic value of human life. Moses sees people created in the image of God and worthy of respect just by virtue of being a human being. Uh, in Hammurabi, those class distinctions are pretty conspicuous. Slaves are not much more than chattel property. Uh, the higher you are, the more value you enjoy. That would be another point. I would say the single most important difference is simply the great, awesome dignity that's connected to God in the Old Testament. The gods of the Mesopotamians, including the gods worshipped by Hammurabi, were fraught with human foibles. They were possessed of all kinds of, of attitudes and behaviors that we would say would be embarrassing for any self-respecting god. They committed adultery, they were seducers, they were liars, they were cheats, they were engaged in all kinds of, of behaviors that we would say represents anything but holiness. You read Moses' description of the Lord God Almighty and you see none of that. You see one great unified root of majestic, holy, weighty truth, the one who deserves our worship and the one who, as he gives us his great law, is giving us something that is for our good, honoring one us. who is incontestably the most honorable one in all the universe and to me that represents maybe the most conspicuous and important difference between Hammurabi on the one hand and Moses on the other.